Well, good morning, Chapel family. Happy Labor Day weekend to everybody. Today's scripture is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter four, verses four through nine. So let's do what we need to do today, which is hear the word of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. So today I want to talk about peace. And just to be sure that we know what that means, there's actually a phrase in this passage which helps us understand it by defining the opposite of of peace. Verse six says, do not be anxious about anything. And so I would say the opposite of peace is anxiety. All right, so what is anxiety? Here's a simple definition, ready? See See if you feel this at all. A feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. That's what it means to be, to have anxiety. Anybody find yourself in that definition? A feeling of worry or uneasiness or nervousness. Maybe this past week with the difficult situation that we've been dealing with uh, in our church, maybe you're connected with that and maybe that's created some of that, that feeling of anxiousness. Maybe something completely different in your life that this has just been a part of what you have been living through recently. I have a friend who's a, a licensed therapist and I talked to her recently and, and she said, In her experience, the number one issue that people are dealing with nowadays is uncertainty. There just seems to be so much uh, economically, politically, in so many areas that we just don't know what's going to happen. And when there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, it tends to lead to anxiety. A few years ago, uh, Time Magazine ran an article called Teen Depression and Anxiety, Why the Kids Are Not All Right. One teenager who was interviewed said this, We're the first generation that cannot escape our problems at all. We're all like little volcanoes. We're getting this constant pressure from our phones, from our relationships, from the way things are today. That's heartbreaking to hear, isn't it? I'm currently reading a book called The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. It's a really important book. You should read, especially if you have young kids, you should should read the book. But let me just read you one quote. This is the great irony of social media. The more you immerse yourself in it, the more lonely and depressed you become. And I think we've all kind of heard that. We all kind of know that's true, but habits die hard, right? And so we keep on doing it, many of us, and so the anxiety levels keep on going up. But it's not just teenagers. It's not just kids. Did you know that if you do any reading on a Kindle, I do a lot of my reading on a a Kindle device, that unless you turn off this option, um, if you highlight stuff, Amazon keeps track of everything you highlight, which is kind of creepy, isn't it? (laughs) But it's really interesting, too, because for people who read the Bible on Kindle, who highlight things in their Bible, what do you think is the most highlighted passage in the Bible? If you had asked me that, I would have said um, the 23rd Psalm, maybe, Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I would have said maybe uh, John 3.16, uh, I would have said maybe uh, the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven. I would have maybe said uh, the Ten Commandments. None of those. The most highlighted passage for people who read their Bible on a Kindle is Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which is the heart of the passage that we're going to look at today, which is all about anxiety and peace. What does that tell you? That anxiety is a big deal. It's probably a big deal in your life. We desperately need peace. So I'm feeling a little crazy today. Instead of my normal three points, I'm going with five. <laughs> you heard me right. 
five points. And these come from the five commands that are in the passage. So it comes directly from those commands. And if you think about it, if there's a command in the Bible, the implication is, well, you have to choose whether you're going to follow that command or not, right? Which is so important in this context, because here's what can happen when anxiety becomes strong. We feel like we're just passive victims of this. We can't do anything about it. Uh, we just have to sit there and take the anxiety as it beats us up, as it beats us up. But it's simply not true. No matter what's happening, the most important choices in life are always open to us. And so this passage gives us five choices that we can make to overcome anxiety. Here's the first one. Choose joy. Choose joy. Verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It, it almost seems strange to command someone to rejoice, doesn't it? Like, you will be happy now. Start. But the reason is because we tend to think, mistakenly, that joy is primarily a feeling, and how can you command somebody to feel something? You can't do that, right? It's also because, I think, we tend to associate joy so closely with everything going well in our lives, but that's not how the Bible sees it. You probably knew Paul was sitting in a prison cell when he wrote this letter to the Philippians, and yet he was a deeply, really joyful person because he had learned to anchor his joy in something deeper. A few years ago, uh, Rick Warren, famous pastor and author, experienced probably the ultimate tragedy when his 27-year-old son took his own life. I don't know if I can think of anything that would cause more grief and sadness and, and, and anxiety than that kind of a loss. So Thanksgiving that year, Time Magazine did a feature about they asked several public figures what they're grateful for, and they actually included Rick Warren in this, in this article. I don't want to read you what he said. This year became the worst year of my life when my youngest son, who had struggled with, uh, since childhood with mental illness, took his own life. How am I supposed to be thankful? God doesn't expect me to be thankful for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. There's a huge difference. The first attitude is masochism. The second shows maturity. I'm thankful that God sees all I go through. He cares. He grieves with me. I'm thankful that even though I don't have all the answers, God does. I'm thankful that God can bring good even out of the bad in my life when I give him the pieces. It's his specialty. God loves to turn crucifixions into resurrections and then benefit the whole world. Guys, I don't have to tell you Life can be brutal. And we talked about it last week. Life is hard. And therefore, because that's true, if you anchor your joy in your circumstances, like, okay, job's going well. Nobody's really mad at me. My body feels good. No problems with kids. No problems with the parents. If that's what it takes to be joyful, you're setting yourself up for, for collapse. But if you learn to root your joy in God, it's like drilling down beneath the surface. The surface is where everything changes, right? And you're drilling down to this unchanging well, the water of life that keeps giving even when things aren't good on the surface. Doesn't mean you're always laughing and joking all the time, always like, you know, in a party mood. That's not what joy is. You can be joyful through tears, and that's still real joy. That's why I so deeply appreciate examples like Rick Warren. Um, I've been so encouraged by the example of Tony Dungy, if you're a sports fan, a former NFL coach. He also had, I believe, his 17-year-old son took his own life. And he, he recovered from that with a sense of, of joy. And it's similar to other stories that we know are, that are much closer to home around here. And in each case, of course, they're human. They grieved. They were devastated. They stepped away from their work for a while. But it didn't, it didn't crush them. It didn't, it didn't win because their joy was anchored in something deeper. During my sabbatical this fall, I sat with a very wise um, older man. Uh, if I said his name, a lot of you would recognize the name. But he's had a lot of problems with uh, his kids, especially his adult kids, just heartbreaking issues. And he said to me, I've learned to picture in life that there are two faucets. There's the pain faucet, and there's the joy faucet. And he said, I always used to think I had to get the pain faucet completely shut off before I could run the joy faucet. And he said, what I've come to realize is that the pain faucet 
is always going to run. There's always going to be pain. And I've learned that you really can run the joy faucet at the same time, and it can be deep and real joy even in the midst of the pain. Man, that is hard-won wisdom, and I needed to hear that. Choose joy. Here's the second choice we can make. Choose gentleness. Choose gentleness. Verse five, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The word for gentleness is a word that was normally used when when you would expect someone to respond by striking back or seeking revenge because they were were done wrong somehow, but instead they respond with self-control. So it's like a, a surprising kind of response. Gentleness when you would expect anger and aggression. You're merging from Route 3 onto 46 West. You're in a long line of traffic. You're crawling along, and all of a sudden, somebody comes up along the shoulder on your right side, and they cut in right in front of you. But instead of leaning on the horn and shouting things that you'll probably have to confess to God later, (laughs) you back up and you just go, you know what? Maybe his girlfriend just broke up with him, or maybe something worse. Gentleness. You post something online that's really meaningful to you, And then someone responds in an angry, disagreeing way and just just kind of tells you off. And you can feel your, your, your heart rate rising. But instead of firing back another response and entering into the mess, you decide to put your phone away or you close down your laptop and you say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me from this circumstance? Gentleness when you would expect aggression. Let it be evident to all. And the only way you can do that is if you know the second half of this verse, the Lord is near. Jesus was an incredible model of this. Look at 1 Peter 2.23. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In other words, Jesus let his gentleness be evident to all. How? How? because he knew the Lord was near, because he knew his father could handle it, that he was right there, that Jesus didn't have to take matters into his own hands because his father could handle it. So when I get all stressed out, I have to ask myself, do I believe the Lord is near and he's in control? Do you believe that in your your anxiety, that that he's got this, that he's, he's under control? When we believe that, it has an amazing effect on our anxiety level. Here's the third choice. Choose prayer. Choose prayer. So this is the, verse six is the first half of that most highlighted passage in the Bible. Can we, let's just read this together, Philippians 4, 6. You ready, everybody? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That is like a mini course in how to pray. There's so much in there. In fact, I'm going to get my three points right here. Three things this teaches us about prayer. Ready? First, pray always. Always. In every situation. There is not a situation in your life where it's not the right thing to do to pray. Not a single situation. If you think about it, that's how any good relationship works, right? You communicate. I've been married 35 years. I work with couples all the time. I would say the secret or one of the top secrets for successful relationships is there's a lot of communication. You just talk, you call, you text. If you looked at my text history with Norma Jean, you would see not a half a day goes by before we're just kind of checking in with each other because healthy relationships communicate and healthy Christians just pray. We just, you communicate with God all the time about everything. And maybe you think, yeah, but Pastor Dave, I mean, God has better things to do and worry about the little details of my life. Um, No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He cares about all of it. There's not a single part of your life that God is not interested in. Jesus said, remember, your father knows the number of hairs on your head. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without your heavenly father knowing about it. And by the way, you're way more important than birds. I mean, parents, you know this, right? You care about your kids' lives. You care about the deep more than they want to tell you. You care about their lives. And God cares about his kids. So talk to him. He's listening and he wants to hear. I would say when we have a great conversational relationship with God, anxiety, anxiety can't compete with that. So fight it. Fight anxiety with prayer. This verse also teaches us to pray specifically. 
It says, present your requests to God. Not pray a general prayer of blessing, not recite lots of memorized prayers, but present individual itemized prayer requests to God. Like the same stuff that keeps you up at night when you're tossing and turning in bed, those things. Talk to God about those specific things. Speak those to God in prayer. Recently, I don't know if this is true of you, but when I'm driving in my car especially, my mind tends to drift to problems, stuff that's wrong, right? And that's probably not good. I should just count my blessings every time I drive. But I tend to think of stuff that's difficult, to hard conversations, hard you know, dilemmas. And, and, and so when I'm driving, I've learned lately, turn off the radio and talk to God about that stuff out loud. Lord, this is how I'm feeling about this. God, this is so bothering me. Lord, help me figure out what to do here. Lord, would you change her heart on this? God, give him power against this temptation in his life. Just, just talk out loud to God about what's going on in your life. God has all the time in the world, and he loves hearing from his kids. And then thirdly, pray gratefully. Pray gratefully. Notice it doesn't say, when you pray for something and God gives you what you ask for, make sure you say thank you for it. Not what it's saying. It says, as you're presenting the requests to God, do it with thanksgiving. Before you even get any kind of answer, well, how, what, like, why and how would, would you do that? Well, because you're convinced that God is infinitely wiser than you and that he really loves you. When you really believe that, um, Tim Keller said it like this, God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knows. And that's true. And if you really believe that, that, he, that he, he, he knows a lot more than you do and he's gonna do what's best for you, then you can say when you're praying, Lord, thank you. Thank you, you're gonna do what's right here. I think about some of the stuff I prayed for that God didn't give me. You know, back in college, certain girls that I wanted to date, you know, that, that weren't interested in me said no. And God said, no, I got somebody better for you. She's sitting right over here, by the way. <laughs> when Norma Jean and I were looking for a house early in our marriage, there were certain houses. I was like, oh, I can just picture us living in that house. God's no, because now I know he was putting us in a specific place, in a specific neighborhood, and I can tell you so many reasons why he put us there. I think of injuries that I've prayed that God would heal quickly, and he just didn't. And now I realize he's teaching me patience and maturity and compassion for, you know, all of you other broken down people. Now I get it. You know, I can walk through it with you. So many things that God didn't say yes, but when I realize that he's always going to do what's best for me, I can say thanks even before any kind of an answer comes. So when you feel anxiety rising up, choose to pray. Pray always Pray specifically, pray gratefully. There's, you might feel like you're in a prison of anxiety. There's no prison that can stop you from praying. Fourth choice we can make, choose beauty. Choose beauty. Verse eight, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, ready? True, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about such things. You have the power to a large degree to decide what you fill your mind with. And so Paul says, decide to fill your mind with things that are noble and right and pure and lovely. And I'm gonna summarize all that by saying things that are beautiful, the way God defines beauty. Choose to fill your mind with beautiful things. I love the Japanese-American artist uh, Makoto Fujimura. He, um, he's a, a, a believer that just lives out his faith in his art. So when he and his wife were just starting out, they moved to a little apartment in Connecticut, he and his wife, Judy. She was pursuing her master's degree. Makoto was working at a special needs school and he was trying to get his art career started at, at home. He said they had a really tight budget. They, several nights a week, they ate canned tuna to make it through the week. Um, they, they, you know, had a hard time paying their rent. So. One night he said he was home in the apartment and he was worried about how we were gonna pay the next month rent, fridge was empty, and his wife walked in with a bouquet of flowers. And he said, I got mad. And I just let out on her and said, how could you buy flowers when we can't even afford to eat? And his wife's reply has been burned into his mind for the last 30 years. She said to him, we need to feed our souls too. Guys, we need to and we get to 
feed our souls. So feed it with things that are beautiful. Um, I have to say this. If you drive around all day listening to political talk radio, no wonder you're angry and anxious all the time, right? Of course you are, especially this fall. Please don't do that. If you spend hours a day on social media comparing yourself with everybody else's house and body and kids and vacations, no wonder you feel anxious. Don't do that. <laughs> Take control of what you put in your mind. You have a lot of control over what goes in to your soul. You know, as in the morning, on those mornings when Norma Jean and I are getting ready at the same time for the day, we carefully choose what music we put on because we realize that it's powerful. It sets the tone for the day. And so a lot of times I've been picking uh, John Foreman, one of my favorite Christian artists, Josh Garrels. When it's her turn, she very often says, Alexa, play Christian dance music, which is a thing. It's a thing, which of course I love because I'm such a great dancer. So it works out great for everybody. But the point is, listening to music like that is a choice to fill ourselves with beautiful things. And we walk away into our day with our souls a little bit larger. There are other times, I'll confess, that we'll listen to, to something or we'll watch something, and when it's done, we're like, why did we watch that? You ever, get, you ever have that? Like, oh, man, I just feel like a little, you know, off after watching that. So choose beauty. Beauty is stronger than anxiety. And then one more choice we can make. Choose action. Choose action. Verse 9, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. When you feel anxiety coming on, one of the wisest things you can do is just to put into practice things that you know are good and right. Don't just sit there and be a passive victim of the anxiety. Get up and take action. In my early years at the chapel, I got to learn a lot from an older pastor named Marsh Davis. Some of you remember Marsh. And when Marsh was counseling people struggling with depression, he would always tell them, you need to fight the tendency to sit around all day, to stay in bed too long. That just breeds more depression. And so get up and, and do something constructive. Clean out the garage. Go visit your parents. Go to the gym and work out. Call someone. And of course, he knew that wasn't the whole solution to depression, but it's an act of obedience to God. It gets you moving in a good direction. So if you're feeling anxiety right now for any reason, maybe God's wisdom for you is just as simple as just take action. Put into practice the things that you know are good and healthy and honoring to God. Sometimes you feel like that's gonna be a sheer act of will. You don't feel like it. You don't feel like you have the energy for it. And you will simply be acting out of obedience to God because God has given you that freedom. So listen. Choose joy, choose gentleness, choose prayer, choose beauty, and choose action. And if you make those five choices, all the anxiety you're feeling will instantly melt away, right? Mm, probably not. Probably not. You know why? Because this is not a self-help technique. You know the Bible is not a self-help book. It's not like you make these moves and God promises you this. You put these coins in the vending machine, you get your treat. That's not how it works. Now, these are really, really wise things to do. <laughs> but if you follow these all to a T, you might still be stressed out. You know why, ultimately? Peace is not a psychological state that we can talk ourselves into. Peace, ultimately, is a relationship with a person. That's where it comes from. So making these five choices is really wise, but as you're making them, realize you aren't creating peace, you're opening yourself up to the Prince of Peace. It's, it's a, you know, the best analogy I can think of is sailing. You go out on the water and you raise up your sail and you position your sail. Okay, you've done everything right, but you're not gonna go anywhere unless there's some, what? Unless there's some wind. The wind is the thing that's gonna move you along. And so making these five choices is like putting up your sail. It's like going, yeah, I'm going to position myself. I'm going to position my sails. You're putting yourself in the path of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. That's, that's who's going to bring you peace. Verse 7 has this awesome promise. It says, and the peace of God, 
which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, it originates with God. It's like the kind of peace that you can only get from, from a relationship with God. And then verse nine, the last verse, says it a little bit differently. And not the peace of God, but the God of peace will be with you. Ooh, that's even better, isn't it? That God doesn't just give you some peace. He says, I'm gonna give you myself. I have been so inspired by the example of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor who defied Hitler uh, in Nazi Germany. And while he was sitting in prison for his speaking out against Hitler, he wrote this little poem. In me there is darkness, but with you there is light. I am lonely, but you don't leave me. I'm feeble in heart, but with you there is help. I am restless, but with you there is peace. Can you imagine the level of stress, the level of anxiety he must have felt? He needed more than the peace of God. He needed to know that the God of peace himself was with him in that cell. Same with Paul, who wrote this letter from the same kind of place. There was so much that was out of his control, but he knew that God was with him. And as we experience our own prisons, things we feel we can't control, it's making us anxious, we need to know that. The God of peace will be with you. Guys, peace is a person. And it's a peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that, that Rick Warren actually returned to loving his congregation and, and, and writing books and fighting poverty and preaching the gospel after he lost his son. That, that, that transcends understanding. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense that, that Tony Dungy went back to working as an NFL commentator and writing some really good books and speaking and loving his family after what happened to him. You would think that people like that would just collapse, right? Like they'd go to drugs. They'd go to, they, would, they would exit life. And the fact that, that they didn't slip into despair, they're walking in peace instead of anxiety, that's testimony that this God that we talk about every Sunday is real. I realize you might feel like anxiety in your life is like, is like the prison that Paul was sitting in and that it's stopping you from doing certain things. I am telling you today, the most important decisions in life are wide open to you wide open to you. So choose joy, choose gentleness, choose prayer to pray about things, choose beauty, and choose action. There's no one that can stop you from making those choices. And when you do, by God's grace, the God of peace will be with you. Would you rise for a close? Well, on behalf of the chapel, I just want to wish everyone a very happy Labor Day weekend. Remember that uh, you, can really, you can really rest. You don't have to just accomplish tasks. Your value is not in what you do, but in the love of God. You can tell your significant other, save the honeydew list for next weekend. <laughs> and I also just want to ask you just to continue praying for your church uh, pray for us as leaders that we would continue just to be transparent <clears throat> and available for your questions uh, and continue to be present in your lives. Pray for everyone involved in the situation and pray for God's blessing on our student ministry. I cannot tell you how thankful I am for countless parents who have stepped up and said, we're in, we're helping. For the students themselves, they're ready to go this new season. If you've been one of those people that stepped up and become a volunteer recently, awesome. So praise God for what he's doing and building something really good for this fall. Uh, but man, just pray for everyone involved. We need that, that shalom that only, only comes from God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, I ask for my brothers and sisters, especially those fighting anxiety right now. Lord, that we would have such a high regard for you that we would know that the Lord is near. And therefore, Lord, we would, we would make these decisions, Lord, to, to, to choose to be people who pray, choose to be people who, 
who do the right thing. God, give us that wisdom, but in our imperfection, because I know we won't pull off the five choices perfectly. God, would you graciously pour your shalom on us, on our church. Lord, it's all by your grace. We receive it now. Open arms to you, Lord. Give us the peace of God and the God of peace. I pray that now in the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. God bless you.